Coming up this week, Google Sheets gains new AI powers. Claude lets you install MCP servers in just one click. A new tool that will transform your chat GPT UI into something that looks a little bit like Slack. And the new state of AI report tells us what percentage of product roadmaps have AI features in development and a lot more. As always, if you enjoy the briefing, hit the subscribe and the like button. So first up this week, if you're a fan of Google Sheets, then you'll be pleased to know that it's getting a brand new AI function. This new function is initiated using the new function name AI, and right now it can be used to generate text, summarize information, categorize information, and analyze sentiment. Up until now, if you've ever tried to do this, you'd have been completely dependent on third-party apps. So I'm a little bit surprised that it has taken Google this long to do this, but it's great to see native AI support added nonetheless. But while Workspace is adding some new features to its product lineup, it actually finds itself with some new competition this week. After acquiring Coda just a few months back, Grammarly has officially acquired the email startup Superman. With this new acquisition, it's clear that Grammarly is attempting to join Notion, Google Workspace, Microsoft and others in building an AI-powered set of productivity tools. Its ultimate goal, according to its press release, is to become an AI productivity platform. Grammarly recently raised a billion dollars in funding to achieve this goal, and instead of giving up equity in the company, it has promised investors proceeds of future revenues. But with so many different competitors now entering this space, who will ultimately emerge victorious? As well as Grammarly, Google may also find itself competing against a new entrant into the space, OpenAI. Reports this week suggest that they are quietly testing a set of products to rival Office and Workspace. According to a report that was published in The Information, the company is working on a collaborative document editing product with integrated chat capabilities, as well as a new browser, a new hardware device, and a social content feed. These new tools align with the CEO Sam Altman's vision of transforming ChatGPT into a lifelong personal assistant. But with these reports, it's now becoming clear why there's tension between Microsoft and OpenAI. And speaking on their freshly launched podcast, OpenAI's head of ChatGPT has shared his view on the future of programming and the skills that might matter in an AI-powered world. He says that curiosity, agency, and adaptability will be the top three skills that will matter at work in an AI world, and they're the skills that OpenAI looks for in new hires. He says that the ability to quickly pick up new topics and skills is crucial, and that being open to change and willing to learn new things will help you to thrive as AI evolves. He also says that the future of software is likely to be transformed, and that AI will become an agentic coding partner, and that asynchronous background workflows will be the norm in the future, where you assign a complex task to AI, and it spends a bit of time working on it in the background, rather than users expecting an instant one-off response. And this vision of the future of agentic programming was reflected in new announcements from Cursor. They released a new web and mobile app which lets you type in a task and then an AI coding agent will get to work on the task in the background. Once the agent completes its task, developers can carry on the remaining pieces directly in the Cursor code editor. Speaking ahead of its launch, Cursor's CEO says that in the future, programming will shift away from coding towards a future where people simply describe what they want and that engineers in this context will become logic designers who map out the logic of an application. But he cautioned that in the short term, AI agents will struggle with major bottlenecks. And this was echoed by a startup founder who this week announced that his company is pivoting away from building AI agents for enterprises. In this post over on X, he shared some of the reasons why his company struggled to gain traction in the AI agent space, which I thought was quite interesting to understand why this space is so difficult to crack. He said that building and deploying custom AI agents for enterprises took much longer than they expected, and that maintaining custom AI agents after deployment required much more time than they anticipated, often with the need for full-time product managers to assi be assigned on each customer. There was also a lack of use case consistency, which made it hard to create repeatable products and go-to-market strategies. One technology that is consistent, though, is MCP. It's been described by Sam Altman and others as the so-called USB-C of AI. And this week, Anthropic's Claude released a new way to use it. Claude Extensions lets users install MCP servers in just one click. And on launch, there are MCP servers available that let you work with Chrome, Apple Notes, iMessage, as well as a local file system MCP server that lets Claude edit your local files. Companies are now racing to adopt MCP internally, with Amazon seemingly leading the way. This week, the pragmatic engineer says that Amazon is likely now the global leader in MCP, with one engineer saying that most internal tools and websites already added support for MCP. And if you want to get some hands-on experience of using MCP, then check out this week's knowledge series, where I've been playing around with Claude's new MCP extensions. And in this piece, I share how to get Claude desktop set up with MCP servers using both the traditional method, which is a little bit fiddly, 
and these new MCP servers. So here's an example of the Chrome MCP server extension in action. And in this, I ask it to visit a website and scan it to perform some competitor analysis. It does this, and then it outputs its result into an artifact. So if you're keen to understand how you might be able to get some hands-on experience with MCP servers and potentially use them at work, then check out this week's knowledge series over on Substack. Now let's move on to some new products and tools that you can use. And first up is a product called Tidbit. And Tidbit allows you to transform your chat GPT into a Slack type user interface with channels and multiple users. So as you can see, the idea here is that rather than just initiating instant conversations with ChatGPT, you can transform it into something that looks a little bit like Slack with different channels. So for example, cooking, fitness, therapy, and then conduct those separate conversations inside those tabs. Tidbit was only announced a few days back, but a demo is available right now. Another product worth checking out is a product that this week raised $40 million in funding called Open Router. So if you're looking to add new AI functionality to your own product, then OpenRouter might be able to help. So this is essentially like a marketplace for AI models. So if you're looking to add new AI features to your product, but you're concerned about what the cost of those AI features might be, then this allows you to integrate into a single API. And then OpenRouter will decide which model to use for which task. It ranks the models based on factors like price and performance. And it even publishes these leaderboards where you can see which model performs best. So if you're looking for simpler ways to use AI models without having to cherry pick which model to use for which feature, then this new startup OpenRouter could be worth checking out. And the final product for this week is a product called Lazy. Lazy lets you save snippets of information from pretty much any source, including articles, Twitter threads, YouTube videos, and a bunch more. And this week, they launched a new version of their product which now comes with knowledge organization features and the ability to build bridges between different types of notes. So if you're somebody who likes to make notes as they visit websites or read Kindle books, but often find yourself forgetting what it is that you've read, then Lazy could be a nice way to augment your note-taking experience. Now let's take a look at some data and trends for the week. And first up is this curious new study, which was published in the Wall Street Journal this week, which says that describing your new features as AI-powered doesn't make users more likely to buy your product. A new study showed that for 58% of users, the addition of AI-powered features made no difference at all to their purchase decisions. And for almost a quarter of users, it actually made them less likely to buy. Now, to be fair, this study does include smart home appliances, which users are notoriously skeptical of, to be fair. So, you know, who needs an AI-powered toothbrush, for example? But the data here is interesting nonetheless, and does suggest that maybe we're reaching a tipping point where the buzz around AI is actually having a negative impact on how consumers see your product. Elsewhere this week, after months of hype and speculation, a new trend is now starting to emerge in the real world, and that is the rise of digital employees. And it seems like banks are some of the first companies to introduce these employees. This week, it was reported that banks such as BNY Mellon have introduced different types of digital employees called digital employee personas. These personas include the code vulnerability cleanup persona, which is designed to identify and fix vulnerabilities in code, and a payment instruction validation persona, which focuses on validating payments and ensuring that transactions are processed correctly and securely. And crucially, these agents will actually have human managers. For folks who have worked in the corporate world, you'll appreciate that it's often the case that managers are obsessed with the number of people who report into them. And the arrival of digital employees could make this problem 10x worse. Elsewhere, OpenAI's head of API product says that API usage is now 700% up year on year, and over a million monthly active developers are now using it. And this reliance on third-party APIs is echoed in the new State of AI report from VC firm Iconic, which was published this week and says that 64% of companies now use third-party APIs to power their AI features. This report is pretty dense and is definitely worth a look. Some of the other nuggets that I found interesting from this report include this chart, which shows that 30 to 45% of product roadmaps are now dedicated to building AI-driven features. In high-growth companies, 43% of product roadmaps are focused on AI, which is up from 31%. And in all other companies, it has jumped from 22% to 36%. 79% of companies are building agentic workflows. And 40% of companies featured in this report include AI features as part of a premium tier product, while 33% include them at no extra cost. So if you're interested in learning more about how companies are using AI in their business, then definitely check out this new state of AI report from Iconic. And finally this week, it may be Independence Day in the US, but Cloudflare's CEO argues that this week should mark Content Independence Day. And to celebrate this, 
This week, the company announced a new pay-per-crawl business model for the AI web. In a piece published over on Cloudflare's website, their CEO says that with OpenAI, it is 750 times more difficult to get traffic than it was with the Google of old, and with Anthropic, it's 30,000 times more difficult to get traffic. As a result, therefore, he says that publishers should be paid per crawl. In a post outlining how this model might work, they explain that AI bots, such as those from Anthropic, OpenAI, and Google, etc., crawl websites to collect content for training or answering their user queries, and that each time a bot requests an HTML page, it should be counted as a crawl. In this graph, you can see the split of different bots from Google, GPT, Claude, and others, and website owners will be given three options when a crawler visits their site. They can either allow the crawler, so grant the crawler free access to the content, they can block it, which is to deny it entirely, or they can select the option to charge, which requires payment at the configured domain-wide price. Publishers and website owners must configure their payment options inside Cloudflare, and of course, they'll need to be a Cloudflare customer. On that note, thanks very much for listening and watching. I'll be back next week with another briefing.